Okay, great. Okay, um, so as Dan said, um, my name is Christine Gouger. I'm Director of Procurement Policy within AMS, um, the Commodity Procurement Program, all within the USDA. So Commodity Procurement Program is the procurement arm for all USDA food distribution programs. So just um, see here, uh, a little, little agenda of what we're gonna go over today. Um, First is what Commodity Procurement Program does, CPP, and history of the programs. There's actually gonna be quite a little bit on that. And then uh, we'll get into the high level how to become an approved vendor for our programs. So first off, uh, what CPP does. Um, as I said, CPP is the procurement arm for USDA Nutrition Assistance Programs. We purchase over $3 billion of American grown food every year. Um, all food has to be 100% grown, processed, and packaged in the United States. And the reason is, is because our purchases support a two-pronged mission of USDA. Uh, the first, supporting American agriculture, and the second, feeding uh, millions of people in the United States. And that's just the order that they're listed. That doesn't mean order of importance. Uh, we serve both of those uh, very important missions. So through those programs, we feed millions of school children, families, and other qualified individuals through both USDA nutrition programs and then also through international food aid. We also buy that, um, that ships to all the international food aid programs that the United States uh, supplies to. So on, on the, uh, for the domestic distribution, we partner with the USDA Food and Nutrition Service who oversees the ordering and the donation of the USDA foods that we purchase uh, for them. Okay, so getting into the history here and how we got to where we are today. Um, really, this all started back in the Great Depression in the early 30s when there was so much unemployment and hunger. Uh, farms were suffering, they had surpluses, they couldn't, sell, they couldn't sell, people couldn't afford to buy. And as a result, crops and livestock um, had to be destroyed um, because they had no market for them. So to address this, um, uh, the Congress passed in 1933 the Commodity Credit Corporation Act, and it created a wholly owned government cor uh, corporation uh, called CCC, and it was allowed to go into the markets and kind of act like a corporate buyer would, um, except they also included the provision that um, they, they would provide loans to farmers and price support when crops were in excess, so they would buy stuff off the market when crops were in surplus. And then also, because times were financially difficult, the government allowed the farmers to pay off their loans in crops. So the government ended up owning a lot of crops and you know what to do with them. So it was, it was a natural fit. Now the government has a bunch of crops on hand and then there's all these people that needed food. And that's why um, the donation programs got started, uh, both domestically and internationally. Um, in 1935, Congress developed a plan for donating some of the surplus farm products to help feed children through emergency meal, emergence, emerging meal programs and other nutrition assistance program. And this had two goals, to provide food for children and families who needed it and to reduce the surplus of the, of the farm products on the market. And that would help stabilize market. So this plan for balancing consumption promotion and help stabilize the markets uh, was very successful and it really remains the heart of what we do today. Um, so there was a lot of growth uh, in, the, in the school meal program um, in the 19, late 1930s, early 1940s. In thir 1937, there were about 3,800 schools that received commodities for their lunch program and they served about 340,000 children, 340, children daily. Uh, within two years, by 1939, the number of schools participating and the number of kids getting fed more than tripled. And then from 1939 to 42, the number of children participating increased by 5.2 million. So it just became huge. 1941-42 were the peak year of participation in, in using commodities in school lunch programs. Uh, during that time, uh, we bought and donated 454 million pounds of food valued at over $21 million in the dollars of that time. Uh, and then there was a little bit uh, of a hiatus because World War II interrupted the food donation to schools 
and most of the food was diverted to feed the troops and the allies. And so the farm surpluses pretty much went away. Um, during that time, American people were encouraged to do things to help supplement supply. And you probably remember that there were um, things developed like the Vic Victory Garden program where people actually grew food to go into the schools and to feed people. So more subsistence farming during that time. And then after the war was over, the National School Lunch Act was passed. It set, it set forth the program's mission, uh, which is to safeguard national security, to address the malnutrition of children, and to keep agri agricultural markets stabilized. So this set in stone, that legislation set in stone, the link between school nutrition programs and USDA foods. Um, and then to be able to accomplish this, you had to have effective administrative organization at every level of government. You need, you need the federal government involved states and locals, and you need to have facilities for warehousing, packaging, and distribution. And that is still how it's run today with the partnership between federal, state, local, um, working to get the food bought and then delivered to recipients. In 1949, there was another act uh, passed and it created what they called the Section 416 program. And it gives USDA price support authority to the Commodity Credit Corporation for these programs uh, to give to State Education Office, Bureau of Indian Affairs, public and private nonprofit, and other needy persons outside the United States. In the 1960s and 70s, there was a lot of expansion in these programs. Um, new programs were piloted, piloted and created to meet the needs of the most vulnerable, the youngest and the oldest Americans. And you can see the programs that were created during that time was school breakfast and, and other feeding programs. In 1961, President Kennedy mandated an increase in the quantity and variety of foods for needy families. And at this time, there was a paradigm shift from it just being a welfare program where recipients received whatever was in surplus uh, to a shift to more of a nutrition program. So, and, and that is still the focus today. Um, it's not just giving away what, what the government would have in surplus, but really trying to address what is needed nutritionally and going out in the markets and buying those. Um, goals were established at this time for minimum assistance levels to schools. And they also established through this, at this time, uh, the food stamp program, but that just began as a pilot program. Um, it got expanded during the War on po Poverty. Um, that legislation was introduced by Lyndon Johnson and passed by con in Congress to uh, address a huge poverty rate at this time. And as a result of this, in 1964, the Food Stamp Act was passed, and that took the program from being a pilot to making it permanent. Um, at this time, USDA foods were actually used in the food stamp program uh, part of it was cash given or food stamps given, but the other part of it was commodities that were that the USDA had. Um, and this was all direct response to the war on hunger. And over the decade, over that next decade during the 60s uh, into the early 70s, food stamps benefits increased and eventually the commodity distribution was reduced and then eliminated from that program in 1977. Uh, in the 1970s, a new program was created that we buy for, the Commodity Supplemental Food Program for at-risk mothers, infants, and children under six. This was a predecessor to the WIC program, and the, suppl the Commodity Supplemental Food Program became permanent in 1974. At this time, the government had fewer surpluses of products, so Congress began appropriating funds regularly so that we, the USDA, could go out and buy food on the open market, which is what we do today. In uh, 1977, there was another significant act. The Food Stamp Act uh, replaced the commodity commodities in the distribution program, and the food distribution program on Indian reservations was established at this time, which we buy for. And commodities were also made available for disaster assistance through that act. In 1981, uh, the temporary food temporary emergency food assistance program was established. Uh, there was more homeless, homelessness and a weakened economy, and Americans were in need of food. And so um, agricultural market at this time, once again, had a lot of inventories, and there ended up being a lot of excess cheese, butter, and nonfat dry milk, and also grain products. Uh, the traditional routes of donating this to schools could not handle all the surpluses, so uh, they created this program so that there would be another avenue 
to get the market surpluses to the people who needed it. So during this time, there was a lot of cheese that was handed out by nonprofit organizations, and uh, people still talk today about government cheese. Uh, let's see, in 1988 uh, through the 90s, you can see the soup kitchens and food bank programs were established to serve the homeless. And by 1989, the surpluses were greatly reduced. Uh, in 1990, the temporary food assistance program became permanent, so they made it the emergency food assistance program. And the soup kitchen and food bank programs were merged into TFAP. So that just became a much larger program. And that pretty much, uh, sums up the history lesson and how we got to where we are um, today with buying these products with appropriated funds rather than giving what's in surplus. And uh, what we do today at AMS, we buy over 300 different commodities. Um, they're kind of grouped into three main areas, livestock, poultry, and fish. And you can see some of the things there. Uh, fruits and veg is another big area. And dairy, grain, and oilseed products uh, is, is another a third area that we buy. Who do we buy from? Well, our vendors are located all over the United States and they're both large and small. Uh, about half of our contracts are awarded to small businesses. And among those, we also have women owned businesses, service disabled, veteran owned businesses, uh, businesses that operate in historically underutilized business zones and Native American owned businesses as well. And how can this benefit you? Um, if you are awarded a contract by USDA, you deliver your product under your branding to recipients, participants all over the United States, uh, also Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. So this helps you to get your product out there and market it to people. Uh, so that fits into the Agricultural Marketing Service mission. And, you know, through what you're doing with us, you'll be partnering to feed children, senior citizens, families, individuals, and schools, food banks, soup kitchens, disaster areas. I know a lot of our vendors are very proud uh, of what they do uh, in selling to us, and, and they, they advertise um, you know, to the public that they, they help out with USDA programs. And another big incentive for our vendors, uh, and we, we do hear this a lot because it doesn't always happen in the, in the commercial marketplace, but we pay our bills on time. Uh, the Prompt Payment Act requires us to do so, and if for some reason uh, we were late with paying anything, it would be paid interest as well. So um, the last topic to talk about is how to become an approved vendor. And this is pretty high level. There is a lot of uh, information on our website. Uh, what I would encourage you to do is review the vendor qualification requirements. And it goes through the approval process and that's on our website. It's not difficult. And we have people that will help you through that every step of the way. Um, to find the AMS Commodity Procurement website, you can just Google USDA Commodity Procurement, and it should be probably the first thing that, that pops up. So getting started, um, there are really kind of six steps here to get to uh, getting paid under a USDA contract. So the first thing that you want to do is on our website, pull up the, U the AMS Master Solicitation for Commodity Procurements. So that contains all the contract terms and conditions that you need to adhere to. So, you know, that's a good, good starting point to understand the requirements of government contracting. And then next in step two, you want to look at the product specifications that we have out there. So maybe you um, produce some grain products, uh, but you need to find out specifically what type we're buying and what type of packages, what size packages are in. And you can find that out in the commodity specifications. And those are all organized by type of commodity um, up on the website, very easy to find. And it also talks about the quality assurance requirements, um, palletization, that kind of thing. And then thirdly, you'll want to review the qualification requirements thoroughly. It's a PDF document out on our website, and it, it tells you all the components that you need to submit an application to us, and which the contracting officer will then review your application, and um, you'll be notified by the contracting officer of approval. So if your application, you're going to need to be registered in SAM, uh, the System for Award Management. It's a free system that you sign up for to have government contracts. Um, you will have to have letters of reference. You'll have to have a letter to tell us about what your company does. And um, other components, there's a food defense plan and um, 
financial responsibility we have to look at. So we ask for financial statements from our vendors so that we can look at that before we approve you and put, us, put you on our qualified bidders list. Um, but once you get all that done, um, you will be on our qualified bidders list and you'll be ready to submit an offer. Um, our solicitations get emailed out to anybody who signs up for them. There's a, a free uh, email distribution list you can sign up for. You can also go to our website. All of our stuff is also on the website. So you review the solicitation, uh, figure out which line items you want to offer for, and as we say, sharpen your pencil uh, to get your prices ready to submit. And then when you're ready, in step five, you submit an offer to us through our electronic bidding system called WebSCM. Uh, when, you're, when you get signed up to be a qualified bidder, we will, we will get a, a free account for you established in that system. We have lots of training resources online and we have a help desk that you can call on that as well. And then after that, uh, you get awarded a contract, you perform and deliver your product, and then you get paid. So here's some, a little bit about tools, becoming a new vendor. Um, if you visit our new vendor website, uh, it was a page within the USDA website, you'll find a 20 minute recorded webinar that walks you through how to become an approved vendor in more detail. So it'll walk you through those vendor qualification requirements. Um, we also have a new vendor checklist that lays out all the steps so you can see, um, make sure you're completing them all. And you can see a little screenshot of that on this slide here. So yeah, we would encourage you to go to the, the website and um, look at the, get that checklist and look at the vendor qualification requirements. And then finally, I'm gonna give you the best resource you can have. Um, we have our, our new and small business coordinator uh, within AMS Commodity Procurement is Andrea Lang. Um, you can send emails to all the staff that works with Andy uh, to at newvendor at usda.gov. And Andy is really great. She's the one that has done the webinars on how to become a new vendor and walk you through the process and answer all of your questions. And then again there, there's the direct address at the bottom of the slide for um, what our website is. And so that's, that's all I had for the formal presentation. Um, I'd be glad to take any questions if that works for you, Dan. Um, yeah, I think we can, probably, uh, we can probably take some questions. We also have, um, have Joe Van Alstein from Little Travers who is, um, is going to be giving a presentation as well. Joe, are you on? Yes, Dan, I'm I'm here. Do you uh do you wanna do you wanna present now and then we can do questions uh, collectively at the end? Uh, you know, yeah, we can do that. I'm just getting there. We go. <laughs> okay, let me stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I you know, and really, I, you know, I'm just probably gonna uh, you know share from. Uh, because I was looking up at your USDA thing, so. <laughs> and I'm just gonna give like a, a high overview of uh, the FTPIR food package work, uh, work group that you know, we're involved with, with uh, you know, the food distribution program on Indian reservations. So hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, you know, so, you know, Christina gave a very good overview of you know how FDPIR um, came into uh, existence, um, you know, and over that time, you know, we've had um, many issues with the food distribution program uh, throughout this time. But back in 1996, they created NAF Dipper, which is the National Association of uh, Food Distribution Programs on Indian Reservations, uh, and this group of um, program directors uh, decided to get together and said, "Hey, you know, we need to work with." Uh, you know, the, the government and, you know, make sure that we start getting uh, better food, you know, into uh, this program, you know. Um, and so, you know, for the last uh, 30 some odd years, I think they've done some very, very, very good work. Um, and with that, you know, I sit on, uh, I'm the president for the Midwest region of FTPIR, and I'm the past national president of national, of the um, association as well. And so, um, with that, you know, it affords me to sit on the, the food package review work group. And the food package review work group uh, was created probably 
about oh, 20 years ago. <laughs> and that was a, you know, a, a group of you know, the national board, um, our, you know, our nutritionist, um, and uh, people to come together and really talk about the food that, that we're getting, because uh, we wanted healthy food, uh, we wanted nutritional food, um, and we didn't want to seem like we were, uh, you know, second hand, um, you know, like a, like a food, food pantry. So with this, uh, there's been great, great, great strides in the food distribution program on Indian reservations. Um, and one of the biggest things that, uh, you know, the, the past directors and presidents and uh, they fought for was to get traditional foods into the food package, you know, because the USDA is a equal opportunity employer and provider. So, you know, that means, you know, everyone's going to get the same thing. And, you know, we know there's 574 different tribes throughout the country and we're not all the same and we don't all eat the same things. Um, you know, granted, you know, we do, um, we do uh, share a lot of same similarities in the food, but when it actually comes down to it, you know, we're quite different in the regions that we represent. So, um, you know, for years, you know, they worked on trying to get bison into the food package. Um, and so, you know, we just uh, didn't have any, any producers who could produce um, bison uh, to the levels of what the USDA needed. Um, and through, you know, the work and uh, the other works of the tribe, we actually have producers now who um, actually produce enough uh, bison um, that we can actually have it in our food package. Um, and so that's, that's a great thing for those tribes out in the mountain plains and Midwest region and um, the Western region who those were some of their traditional foods was bison. Um, and it's bison hamburger uh, or bison burger, excuse me, not hamburger, but bison burger um, that, that we get in, in this food package. And one of the things we look at is like how, you know, how do we switch it up a little bit? Um, you know it gets boring eating the same thing over and over and over again every month and you can only you know prepare burgers so many ways uh, so you know that's something that uh you know the food package review work group will look into um and see what other things that we can do or other products that are out on the market that we could probably uh put into the food package you know uh we look at like chicken you know we we have whole chickens in the food package and we have boneless skinless chicken breast and then we also had bone-in chicken um, you know so all three of those were different um, but again you know we're looking at uh, uh, the, the type of food so you know the the commodity procurement or FNS AMS all these different uh, acronyms you know they work together to provide us this food um, but you know we would they, they would buy you know three months worth of whole chicken and then they would buy three months worth of bone-in chicken and it would switch every month and the food package review work group was like hey you know we would like to see some boneless you know skinless chicken in in the food package so uh you know we brought it to them and we talked with ams and you know they went through their procurement processes and they they had a vendor who did um boneless uh skinless chicken breast so now we have that in the rotation as well um you know we have whole chicken for three months and then we have the boneless uh, skin, skinless chicken for three months, and that keeps rotating on and on. So, you know, looking at that from a, um, a traditional food pers uh, perspective, you know, we would probably like to see something like that, um, you know, with, uh, with uh, bison. Um, and so, you know, we are always looking for those, those type of producers out there um, who can come with us um, and um, help us work. I know uh, the next traditional food we had um, that the work work group had talked about putting into the food package and voted on uh, was lamb. Um, you know, because the Southwest tribes, uh, you know, lamb is uh, one of their, you know, their foods and traditional foods. And, uh, you know, the, the government went out and put out bids and no one bid for the lamb. So uh, we didn't get any lamb for the year. Uh, and, you know, so that was kind of um, upsetting. And we were trying to figure out, you know, why no one bid on uh, uh, on these products, you know, because one of the things when uh, Christine talks about specifications, you know, the food package review work group 
gets to go ahead and look at the specifications and help create the specifications for the healthy, um, for the food that's coming into the food package now, you know? So, you know, we've, you know, added less fat, less salt to these um, items that are into the food package. Um, they have to fit with the dietary guidelines. Um, you know, and we like the, the organic stuff as well. We like the grass fed, you know, um, products, but, uh, you know, that was one of the things we looked at with like, uh, wild rice, uh, Minoman. Um, sorry. Um, so that was one of the things that we looked at. So that was one of the things we looked at was, uh, uh, creating the specification for wild rice. You know, we didn't want um, patty grown rice like Uncle Ben's. We wanted a hand harvested traditional wild rice. You know, one of the things is they got together and they, they were like, well, we don't want it fired over propane. You know, it needs to be a wood fired um, uh, drying method for, for the, the wild rice. And so, you know, finding those those producers who produce like that, it was, it was very tough. And for the first year, you know, I, I know Dan worked with uh, White Earth and Leech Lake uh, to produce, you know, a bunch of wild rice for us. Um, but then, you know, wild rice is a, is a crop. So, you know, we have good years, we have bad years. Um, and right now we don't have enough um, wild rice to put into the food distribution program uh, because we don't have enough producers out there um, producing uh, wild rice um, for what we would like. And I think one of the things, you know, I look at here uh, being from Michigan, you know, uh, wild rice is one of our traditional foods. We've, uh, we've ate it for um, since time of memorial. It's part of our creation story. It's part of where we, um, you know, decided to stop here. And so, um, you know, looking at that stuff, uh, you know, we would like to, to, to bring that back um, here to Michigan, especially. I know that for um, a fact because, you know, with uh, the, the people moving in and, you know, killing the lakes and, you know, killing the, the, the Minoman because they don't like to look at it, you know, that's really affected the, the Minoman here in Michigan. And so, you know, to bring it back to Michigan from those uh, tribes out there um, in Minnesota and Wisconsin um, is, is valuable because, you know, our people here just love it. And the people, you know, on the food distribution program really love to see, you know, wild rice back into the food package. You know, they like to see the bison in the food package. Um, the other one that we recently well, got in the food package over two years ago was uh, wild caught salmon. Um, you know, uh, we went out to uh, Alaska and they actually have um, producers, uh, who actually, you know, who are tribal, who catch the salmon and actually put it um, into our, um, into our, um, uh, our food package. So one of the things, you know, I think that's good. I'm on that one. Um, our next traditional food that we're looking at is um, walleye. And, you know, one of the things is, uh, you know, we're looking for a producer of walleye who can go out um, and do it. And we want these, these traditional foods to be produced by, uh, um, you know, native people, you know, uh, we want to support um, their um, economies as well. Um, because that's what makes it traditional, right? <laughs> you Joe, know? can I ask, Joe, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the 2018 farm bill had, a um, it had a, a new provision in there for a self administration, tribal self administration of, of the food distribution program. Would you be able to talk more about that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the 2018 farm bill was, was pretty hu huge for Indian country and especially at the PIR because, um, one of the things, uh, you know, we, we look at this and again, the USDA being a, um, a huge, a huge program, you know, and they, they're an equal opportunity and provider. Um, food distribution programs, we as routinely serve um, 80 to 100,000 people a month on this program, you know, and, and that's a lot of food um, that, that, that goes out of these doors. 
um, across the country because there's 103 ITOs who run this program. Um, so with that, you know, one of the things we looked at was like, you know, how do we go about, um, you know, helping these producers who can't produce enough, you know, and one of the things they've always talked about was like, well, you know, the Southwest people don't like wild rice. They don't know what it is. And the same people for the Midwest region. We don't, we don't, we don't know what blue corn meal is. You know, that wasn't one of our traditional, you know, foods is blue corn meal. Um, so, you know, we were like, why do they make us um, take it? if that's not what we want or not what we would eat. So, you know, we all sat down and we're like, you know, how can we make this, um, you know, a reality? So uh, we talked about 638 um, self-governance contracting, and we thought that would be um, a way for uh, these food distribution programs to go ahead and actually um, have control of the food that they um, put into the food distribution program. Um, because Again, you know, the Midwest region, we're 26 tribes here um, within this region that offer this program. Um, and, you know, we would really like to see wild rice in our food package. Um, and just like the Southwest, you know, they wanted catfish, you know, in their food package. And, you know, that's what they got. And, you know, we're not necessarily all, of, um, all about catfish here in the Great Lakes area, <laughs> you know. But so that was one of the things we looked at was the um, getting the, uh, the self-governance contract. So I know uh, through the Farm Bill, uh, Congress um, authorized a $5 million demonstration project for this. And this would allow the FTPIR program to go ahead and actually procure um, foods that would actually go into their food distribution program. Uh, and so, you know, right now, take for instance, I have no wild rice. I would love to be able to go to a um, a producer who has wild rice and be able to buy, you know, um, a thousand pounds of wild rice here, you know, instead of having a, the USDA actually purchase 40,000 pounds, right? And so um, I would love for us to do that. So they put in this demonstration project um, for this to happen. Um, of course, they authorized it for $5 million. Um, they did not appropriate the money for that in the farm bill. So we, we had, we still had more work to do. Um, we actually went out, um, and then the last, uh, bill that was the last, um, actual, uh, funding bill that was passed in December, we had $3 million, um, appropriated for this program. So now, uh, the USDA has $3 million, um, in its coffers for us to, um, work uh, to work together to come up with a way to make this program work for us. Um, so the USDA and the Tribal Leaders Consultation Work Group, um, which is a group of uh, elected leaders that was created by NAF Dipper to um, address these issues, are working together a way to find out um, who or what tribes uh, would go ahead and actually um, would actually go ahead and uh, demonstrate this project. So um, that's what we're working through right now. Uh, we have until 20, the end of 2021 to, to go ahead and uh, spend this, this $3 million. And that's one of the things we're looking at doing is maybe having um, a demonstration ITO in each region. So one would be in the Southwest, one would be in the West or the Western region. Midwest region and then the Southwest region. Um, so that would give uh, some tribes um, a little bit more uh, flexibility to put their traditional foods into the food package. Um, one of the things we looked at with that as well is, you know, these native producers, um, you know, we can't ever really compete with the, the, the federal government on uh, its buying power, right? So um, when we go out and you know, buy canned foods, you know, I will never be able to buy canned foods at the price the U.S. government can. But with this new one, we can go out and work with uh, uh, the tribal farmers, the tribal producers um, who are near us to put their products into our store or into our food distribution program. So does that help there, Dan? Yeah, definitely. And then uh, I've got a picture up here on, on the screen. Uh, are you able to, to see the 
Your oh, screen. Yeah. Oh, that's a great picture. Yeah, do you oh, want to talk? Of my broken down barn. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that one that, well, you had a lot of snow in, in one year, I think, right? But, um, yeah. But do you want to do you want to talk a little bit just briefly about your farm here and you know are you working to get would you hope to be able to get like the squash and, and the produce into into the program? You know, and so that's the thing is like uh, my tribe, the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Adult Indians, um, really look forward and our, and our past ancestors look forward um, to this day and to this time, even with COVID nineteen um, and about food sovereignty, and so. Um, back in 2006, they purchased a 300 acre farm. And with this farm, um, you know, they were looking at food sovereignty and what are we going to do to feed our people? Um, you know, and so uh, they, they bought this 300 acre farm and um, it, uh, it's called ZB Mijuang. It's the ZB means river, Mij is food. So it's a place where food grows near the river. Uh, we have a river that go, runs right through it. Uh, we grow everything from A to Z, as my farm manager would say, arugula to zucchini on there. Um, we have five hoop houses um, and gothic tunnels. Um, where'd my picture go there, Dan? I like looking at it. <laughs> but, uh, oh, there we go, there's some more. So yeah, there's inside of one of our 200 foot hoop houses. Um, you know, and we worked with the USDA, um, uh, NRCS grant to, to put these hoop houses in. Um, I think we're working on a, working on another one right now uh, for this year. But uh, yeah, ZB Mijuang is, uh, is is growing food like crazy. And when I hired my my farm manager, you know, he walked into the, my FDPR store one day, and he's like, he's like, Joe, why aren't why aren't why isn't the ZB Mijuang produce in this store here in your food distribution program? And I'm like, you know, I'm trying to get it in here, and you know, that's one of the things is like uh, we do grow, you know, like the picture of the squash, which is the Gete Okosamin squash. You know, we grow that a lot. Um, people are really love it around here, and I would love to see that, you know, in our store. I'd love to see more of our traditional foods in the store, such as you know, hominy. Um, different types of uh, uh, corn flour, corn mush, those those traditional foods into this food package here. So uh, that's one, one of the things that, oh, there's a picture of our Minogan markets. Uh, we opened up a, a store uh, and that's where we sell our uh, fresh produce from ZB Mijuang into this market as well. Uh, we do maple products, maple sugar, maple candies, uh, maple syrup. And then also um, with this, we also love to work with other uh, native producers to put their products in our store and not just sell our own, you know? So um, if you look off to the right in that little picture there, uh, yeah, I think we see some bow and arrow um, flour in there, some cornmeal. Um, and we do have a lot of different, uh, I think there's some Red Lake pancake mix in there. Uh, you know, so we do work with a lot of, uh, uh, different uh, producers to put their stuff in our store as well. Uh, we sell fish, you know, our fishermen come off the lake um, and then, you know, it gets processed and then we um, put it into the store and sell that as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work that we want to do out there with uh, native producers. Um, you know, just as much as I want to get my product out there, I want to bring their product, you know, into our store and sell it here as well. So is that That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joe. I think we have a couple of questions from uh, from participants. Courtney, did you want to read uh, the question? Yes. So we have one question. Um, so how would one with a small farm about 1.2K harvested a week mix leafy greens and herbs start selling locally instead of all through the US, either to elders, diabetic program, through the procurement program, or maybe a CSA through the tribes, question mark? Um, you know, I, I, and so I guess I, I can answer that question. I, I know with our, um, with DB Mijuang, you know, we're into, 
here in our area, we have cities that are really um, focused on farmers markets, you know. Um, and again, you know, we still fight um, uh, to get into some of these farmers markets, you know, because some of them have uh, mile radiuses, like you can only be 30 miles from this food market, you know. And I'm like, we're in Northern Michigan. I mean, like, come on. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so we, we do a lot of selling to, to food uh, at, at the farmers markets, or we did until this COVID thing happened right now. Um, and then, so right now we kind of had to switch our model with ZB Mijuang, uh to do uh, harvest baskets. Um, and then we work with another local company uh, called Local Eats, and they go around um, to all of the, the farms and they go ahead and they produce or, you know, gather, let's say, you know, your leafy greens. And then they buy it wholesale from us and then they put it into a food basket and then they go out and sell that food basket um, on their their website. So, um, you know, that, that fits a, a small little niche market here for them, um, you know, because we don't necessarily always have time to do a, a TSA at that because we're, we were young, we were getting our name out there, we were letting people know, you know, who Zibi Mijuang is, you know, being a tribal farm. Uh, you know, we re really wanted to get our name out there that we produced, you know, high quality, um, you know, vegetables. So, um, and we're working, you know, very closely as growing more traditional food out there, you know, more traditional corn. I think last year we grew um, two acres of uh, the, the Bear Island Chippewa Flint corn. Uh, you know, and we turned that into hominy and we're, you know, working to put that into the market to sell um, at our farmer's markets. I know we're working with some uh, some of the, the, the chefs throughout the country uh, to work with them to grow their, um, you know, I, I one, you know, she wants beans. And she's like, Joe, can you grow me beans? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so uh, we're working with her uh, to, to um, grow beans for her. Uh, because she can't always find beans that she needs that are traditional uh, for the dishes that she makes. So, you know, that, that's one thing I would work with is, uh, you know, work with the local uh, chefs in your area or the local native chefs in your area. Yeah, and I would add on to that of, um, you know, I think as Joe was talking, a lot of it's about relationship building and you know, getting out to some of those different programs and trying to talk to them. Uh, the schools oftentimes will have uh, some of their funding it needs to be going through uh, more of these of the purchasing programs, but oftentimes uh, a lot of the schools will also have funding that has that's more discretionary where they can, um, they've got more control over how they spend it. If, uh, if you do want, if you wanted to be able to, to uh, to get fresh fruit vegetables into a procurement, um, there's a program called the DOD Fresh. We're going to be doing some additional training on that. I know University uh, of Arkansas recently did a webinar. We did one about three years ago. There are some more hoops that you have to jump through in terms of having a good agricultural practices certification, um, but we'll be, we'll be covering that more in future webinars. Hey, Dan, this is Christine, if I can jump in for one second. Um, USDA does have a pilot program that we are currently doing for unprocessed fruits and vegetables. And uh, this is also described out on our website. It's uh, a program where the processors become approved with us, but they're selling directly to schools, we, and we pay the bills for that. So it, it, the idea of that program was to get more local foods into the schools. Great, that's, that's interesting. Um, we'll try to, to work with you, Christine, and get a little bit more information on that and, and share it as part of the outreach with, uh, with the recording of this webinar. Is that farm to school? This is different. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we have additional questions? Okay, well, we will have the recording of, uh, of this webinar. We'll have it posted on the Indian Ag YouTube channel. 
within the next couple of days and we're working on, uh, on, on hosting some additional webinars and um, we'll be having more online content in the near future. Courtney, did you want to share anything else on, uh, on the upcoming webinars or other content that we're working on? Um, just, just to stay tuned on our, our Facebook page, um, we'll have more updated content on there for the dates with the different webinars that are, that are coming up. Um, I know we have one this Thursday. Um, it's exporting based for the Middle East, um, getting your, your products out into the Middle East. But other than that, I think that's kind of all we've got going right now. What's Kelsey's uh, webinar? She is doing a bootlegging or business, and she's going to do a webinar on marketing beef. And that's on Thursday? That is not on Thursday. I might have to look at the date on that. Okay. All right. Well, I want to give a thank you to both Christine and to Joe for joining us today. And again, we'll have, the, we'll have this uh, webinar online shortly. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.